on, he's looking. Let's get into it. Jeb's, Jeb's with her. We're coming out to the Plant Sciences Building today. And just in case you aren't aware, the Plant Sciences Building is the home of the Plant Sciences Initiative, where we bring together interdisciplinary research teams to work on agricultural issues. So really happy to have you here. Has anybody not been to this building before or uh, heard about the Plant Sciences Initiative? Yeah, okay. Well, we'll talk at the reception later. We can, we can talk some more. Um, but yeah, so I just wanna give a couple of quick slides. So this is a brand new seminar series that I've created. And really the goal of this, and I called it mashup. I was told that we're tired of calling things seminars. No more seminars. Let's call it something else. So I chose mashup, um, kind of corny, but we're going to go with it. Um, so combining elements from two or more sources. So really the whole point of this is we want to be able to have our industry partners have a platform where they're able to talk to the local ag tech community and then also have our NC State experts have a platform to be able to talk to the industry um, community as well. So uh, I'm curious, in the audience right now, can you raise your hand if you're NC State or academia? Okay. And then who is coming from industry or elsewhere? Awesome, awesome, great. Well, thank you so much for coming. And I think this is gonna be really great. We're gonna have a seminar session and then afterwards we're gonna go up to, let me show you. The innovation hub which is on the third floor and that's our landing pad for our industry partners so the companies that are members of the innovation hub are the ones that we're targeting to give presentations at national um, so after this we'll have a mixer up in um for five, from five to six in the hub um, it's on the third floor and basically we ask companies to join as members of that space and when they're a member then they have access to that space to be able to meet with our faculty students staff uh, talent acquisition, um, whatever they want to do, they can use that space to do business from it. Um, right now, we currently have several uh, seven companies that are members of the Innovation Hub. These are the companies. So today, our very first mashup industry partner is going to be SAS, and we have the pleasure of having Dr. Mark Wolf here, who will be presenting. We do have plans for our next mashup. It's going to be on May 1st. So if you want to take a picture of the QR code or just come to me after and I can give you the link. Um, <clears throat> so that's going to be on May 1st from four to five. And we've secured BSFC treatment. It's going to be our industry partner that will speak. And then from NC State, we'll have Dr. Josh Pierce, who's in the Department of Chemistry. So very excited about that. And hopefully this will turn into a really successful continuous series um, and hoping that everyone gets to come, network, meet new people, think of new ways potentially to collaborate. So very excited to get this going and see how it is. All right, one more, one more event I just want to mention is on April 11th, we're going to be launching our last piece of the building that hadn't been finished yet, and that is our incubator space. So this is a space on the fourth floor that's for university spin out startup companies to have a location where they can grow their company, do some lab work, bring in investors. Um, and we have a commercialization council who's steering a whole package for startup programs, uh, for the startup companies to have a whole program to help them launch their company. So if you're excited to learn more about the startup program that we're offering, please come. We're gonna have a summer from four to five. And we're gonna have some speakers from um, startup companies that we're working with. And then afterwards, we're going to have a really great reception from 5 to 6.30. We already have like 80 people RSVP, so it's going to be a really awesome event. All right, so with that, I'm really excited that our first mashup speakers, we have Dr. Mark Wolf from SAS, and then our NC State um, member is going to be Haley Hauser from the Data Sciences Academy. So first, I think we'll have Dr. Wolf start off. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Do I do that or do the gentleman behind the curtain? Uh, should be. Oh, it's, it's well, hello everyone. Thank you. Uh, Mark Wolf, uh, as was said, I, I, I am from SAS. I've been there a long time. My second career, 18 years. Um, my, um, my graduate work was here at NC State. So I graduated from the toxicology department with my doctorate. And I actually also have a master's from the entomology department, believe it or not. Um, and for super full disclosure, 
I went from working uh, with Rumpelank, which some of you may be familiar with that company, uh, to then moving to Germany, where for a very short time I was with Bayer, if you remember what happened back in those days, worked with BASF for a couple of years, and then finally abandoned science and went completely for the math, working at NC State, where I have a really unique position in the sense that um, uh, it's the closest you can come to being tenured in industry. I spent a lot of time thinking interesting projects, how to apply math and analytics to those projects, publish, uh, speak. So it's always a treat to come back to state uh, where I spent, you don't want to know how many years I spent here in graduate school, but now I even have a daughter here. So all great. So what I want to talk about is, um, I can go back one. The man behind the screen is busy. Let's see if this will work. Technology is always the weakest link. The buttons don't work. Not being able to move this time. Yeah, Daniel, the clicker isn't working and- uh... So I'll keep talking. Uh, what I want to talk to you about is work that I've been doing. Um, the application of analytics and math problems in biology or even beyond biology often changes names, but it tends to be the same thing. Um, it used to be called mathematics, then we had statistics, then somebody came up with data mining, now it's called machine learning, and more and more you hear artificial intelligence. It's all the same thing. At its most fundamental level, it's pattern recognition. And I don't care what anybody else tells you. If you, if you go into chat GPT and you're looking at thinking, wow, amazing technology, no, it's regression to the mean using natural language processing and pattern detection. That's all it really is. And it's always the same thing. We just develop better, more efficient, and newer techniques to accomplish the same thing. So I'm going to talk to you about how to apply pattern recognition to solve more complex problems using the concept of digital twins, which is also a bit of two buzzwords. It'll probably turn out to be something else in a few years, but today we just agree that it's digital twins. What is a digital twin? I literally have a semester's worth of material, so I'm going to, I'm going to try to squeeze it all in, in in 20 minutes. A digital twin is a component of a broader view of what's called generative AI. Now, you saw in the previous slide, to generate, to create, to produce, the reason chat GPT and other large language models are generative is because it takes what it has read, literally read, because it's about natural language processing and language. It takes the prompt you gave it and it generates from that prompt based on what it's read through really a, a hugely complex set of probability distributions an answer. That answer did not exist until you asked the question. That's why it's generative. So the question is, what other ways can we use generative AI? Well, synthetic data generation, believe it or not. I know a biologist would say, make up data? You know, I'll get defrocked and disbarred or whatever. No, synthetic data can be generated in a way that improves model performance, or particularly in many predictive models. Uh, large language models as a core component of gathering and organizing data. And finally, digital twins. And I'm going to talk about digital twins in some detail and then give you an example of a digital twin I built. So it's nice for somebody to come here and tell you a bunch of definitions, uh, tell you how you can do things. What I think is really important is then to show you something that was actually done, and more importantly, with my own hands. So it gives you a sense of what it takes and what the value might be. This is actually very important. It's not just pedantic to give you these definitions. It's a virtual representation, virtual means almost real, of a entity, something, a process, a set of decisions that is synchronized not only with historical data, but with data now in time, real data. So it's a bi-directional flow of information between a set of models that describe, as you see here, something, and the data from that real world something feeding those models and then that producing some output. That's a very important definition. And I do that because it is not a simulation. 
People often think that a digital twin is simply a simulation of something. A simulation is an idealized representation, data modeling some process or entity that doesn't change. That simulation will always give you the same exact thing because you modeled it on a set of data. Those data are not changing. Yes, you've mathematically described that process, but it's static, it's not dynamic. A digital twin, on the other hand, becomes dynamic because you're feeding that, in effect, simulation with data from the real world. And in a sense, you can use the terms parameterizing the models that create the digital twin to produce some information to make a prediction, make a better decision, or to optimize a process. What if I do this versus that? How will the digital twin respond? Often digital twins can be thought of as something where you can conceive, how do I do the best given a set of models imbibed with real world data that the models are now learning from those data and they're generating an answer. They're not just replicating or recapitulating an answer, they're generating an answer. I know this, is, okay, I'm gonna move through this because it's, it's so dense and pedantic. Um, what we're really doing is taking the physical world and in this case, I will also, it's also very important to note uh, the group I work with at SAS now is the Internet of Things Division, IoT. I moved there because I thought perhaps the most significant change in the application of analytics to solve any problem in research, development, and industry will be the notion of streaming and moving telemetry. And that idea is that we don't collect data, analyze it, and report on it. Now we collect data, analyze it, build models, introduce real-world continuous streaming data, and then make continuous decisions from that. And the way we do that is through connectivity, and connectivity is IoT. IoT is basically the means by which sensors produce data and connect back to the models and facilitate digital twins. That's that. I'll move on. Um, why today? Uh, we, why didn't we have digital twins before? Well, before, what did we have? We had design of experiments. We had factorial analysis. We had ways and we could use data to statistically model a process and then use that to maybe predict an optimum process optimization using factorial analysis and, and, and similar techniques. But that was historical retrospective and it didn't learn. Um, discrete event simulation, the next sort of level of, of deeper analysis. Again, historical and static. Today, several things have happened. You always add the growth in computational power to any technology and it will advance it and improve it. Uh, the ability to access more data. Chat GPT literally read every single URL in the world and every and all the content in every URL and all the PDFs and all the Word docs. Access to data. That's what was transformative about it. Um, including the techniques it used to do that and to organize all that data. That's why it's so expensive and takes so compute time. Uh, streaming data, which I'll talk about in a minute. And finally, this idea that we can bring in biologically relevant data that previously we could not, hence things like um, the work in, in AlphaFold and, and, other, and other incredible achievements that follow this sort of pattern of how did we get there. All right, this is, uh, if I only had two slides, I'd show you these two slides. This is transformative, and it should be transformative in the way you think about data analysis and what you do with that. Here is an absolutely traditional view, for as long as I can remember, of collecting data from places, storing it somewhere, doing some analysis, that analysis informing you how to maybe pull different data, and then reporting on it. We've been doing that forever. Recently, all of a sudden, we have this capability to access data that's moving. Not data that just is put into a database organized and sits there. That data is literally moving. And it's moving at high frequency and potentially in tremendous um, uh, uh, dimensionality. What, what effect now does this concept of streaming data have on this incredibly long-lived process paradigm of, of collect, store, analyze, report. Well, now we have data that we don't necessarily need to store and organize. It's time series data, it's time stamp data, it's flowing. 
we now move it into a completely new form of analysis where models are built using the static historical data. They're applied to the streaming data. The streaming data now is scored. I'm just gonna use a bit of jargon here, meaning some algorithm, some equation is looking at the moving data, making a decision and reporting on it. That then becomes its own data stream. We've just created completely new data, which is the result of the model scoring the streaming data. That in and of itself presents completely new opportunities for analysis. And when I get to the end, you'll, you'll see where I'm going with all this. So what that means, it's now we can create a learning adaptive system. This is an architecture for a system that learns. And it looks a lot like a lot of biological systems, which I'll talk to in a minute. The changes that we now can access, analyze. And then the other beautiful thing about this is we can't possibly store all the data that's going to be available. So the concept of edge analytics, where intelligent devices that sense, communicate, analyze, and report will do independent analysis and decide which data to throw away. And maybe we'll only keep the score result. So again, if I had two slides, it'd be the one before and this one, because this is really what makes a digital twin possible. That's the difference. Uh, if you think about, I'm not, a plant scientist by training, but but um, my wife spent 10 years in crop science doing tobacco breeding. So I have a little bit of background just from osmosis at home. And she recommended that I probably put these uh, these topics on there. I will trust her that she was correct. Abs absolutely. Think about those words up here. And then the words I said before, optimization, um, predicting, managing, what if scenarios in breeding, I know there's already a tremendous amount of, of progress done in, in silico breeding, but now imagine in silico breeding augmented by more immediate uh, data coming in from the field, environmental data. So you're, you're breeding two things. There's a prediction of what you think that's going to be, but then you're, you're monitoring uh, water, you're monitoring sunlight, you're monitoring all these environmental parameters. And now you're saying, do these have any effect on what I predict will be from this cross? So you can do experiments and ask questions that you could not before. Um, all those are obvious. Uh, precision agriculture, this idea now that intelligent devices are sensing, acting, uh, whether it's, uh, you've seen the lasers hitting weeds or, or um, uh, very specific application of herbicides, fungicides, pesticides, and any kind of other chemicals. All of that can be done by systems that are adaptive learn, sense their environment, and act. And in essence, all those are small digital twins of something that you also have in your computer that you can monitor and control. Um, it gets scary in a bit. All right, just a little bit of history, because I, I, I absolutely believe that history is so important in science. Um, this is from 1961, Ross Ashby. He, he was actually a, a psychiatrist, but he was also called the father of cybernetics. And this quote is absolutely brilliant. He believed in 1961 that we can make machines as intelligent as we please. But he claimed that both machines and humans are bound by basically IO, input output. That we are, our intelligence, our level to understand the world around us and act on it is limited by how much we can take in and then how much we can push back out to make that effect. So what he was saying is that the limits of machine intelligence are no different than the limits of human intelligence. It's the question is, how do we get the machine to absorb, process, and respond with as much ability as humans? And of course, we can do the calculations of neurons and, and the computational density of the brain that's been done. It's pretty big. And machines are still struggling, really, to get at that efficiency. The second thing he said is that once we have all that information, and it describes a particular system, this, this law of requisite variety, how do we understand the stability of a system? So if I build a complex set of models, it's a digital twin that's, that's, um, that's uh, describing, predicting, understanding, and optimizing some process, how many states are there that I need to control? And how many states need to then be controlled, not only through data updating, but the, the means by which they're controlled. 
And that then will give you a sense of the potential equilibrium of the system, meaning it won't crash or it won't hallucinate or it won't give you bad data. So we need to be aware of the IO nature of intelligence, but we also need to be aware of what is equilibrium in terms of intelligence based on states of control. And this gets, I'm not an engineer, but this gets really close to engineering. So those are fundamental challenges. And then it gets even weirder. Uh, the concept of emergent behavior. So if I build these wonderful models and have all this great data, I have a digital twin and I fully understand this process or this entity and I can do what if, I can, I can change things. Uh, General Electric builds digital twins of jet engines, runs them to destruction in silico. And then in the real engine, the parameter that broke the engine actually will do it in real life. Uh, the famous story of digital twins is Apollo 13 where they built a replica and they broke it just like the real thing. And then they fixed it and see what would happen. That was an analog digital twin. Today, we basically do the same thing electronically. Uh, I have a chamber. Everything is absolutely identical. I seed an identical drop of water in that chamber. Nothing is different about anything. I get two different snowflakes. How do you predict that? What is emergent behavior when you're dealing with, let's say a digital twin deciding a diagnosis and a treatment for a person. Could that kill somebody? If the computer says, give them this much of this drug versus that. So we, we, I, I brought up those three slides just to give you a sense that it's, there are huge challenges. Now, here are my identical twin daughters. Um, ironically enough, one is at NC State and the other one is at my undergraduate alma mater in Baltimore at Loyola College. So twin daughters, and they, they're both legacies uh, at different schools. Uh, we all suffer from autoimmune disease, and that causes pain in our joints. And why am I showing you a picture of my daughters? I am a scientist. I have identical twin daughters at home. What do you think I do in my spare time? Experiments on them. <laughs> and the fact that they're twins and I work in the space of digital twins, I use them to build a digital twin, to validate it, to test it, and to see if I could have an in silico version of them that's as good if not better in understanding how they behave than they are in their physical state. So they both suffer from a level of joint pain. Uh, the scientists among you will know that genotype and phenotype don't always, aren't always the same. They have the identical genotype, but their phenotype in terms of the immune system and the pain they experience in their joint is completely different. So I set a challenge for myself. I said, could I build a digital twin of the human neuromuscular system such that when parameterized with their data, it would predict how much pain they're in? And I ended up building not only a model, but a system for measuring pain. Believe it or not, that's never been done before. So what did I do here? So I did two things. I used computer vision, which is also a... Um, a huge component now of generative AI. It's not just text, it's also vision. And what I did was I used the camera with a, a human pose estimation. It's basically a model that's trained on where the joints are and it tracks me as I sit and stand and it measures the position of my body in time and space. Now you can apply this to anything. I just have to apply it to me and my kids. And that, that component there that you see are X, Y, and Z coordinates, right? a place in time. Then I put a, uh, an accelerometer and a gyroscope on the back of my neck, C7, and I measured the actual physics over here. Oh, hold on, I messed that up. I just turn off the presentation? No. So I'll keep talking if, I, if we can fix it this one. Gentlemen, oh, thank you. So what I did was I took the, sen the sensor on the back of my neck, which was transmitting linear acceleration in units of G and rotational angle in radians per unit time. So what did I have? I had a situation where as I moved, I was collecting streaming high frequency data of the position of my joints in time and space. 
as well as the forces and rotations associated with my movement. In essence, I was collecting information to generate a digital twin of the what? The neural control of the muscular system. I did that in such a way that through repetitive measurements and other people, we created a standard of norms, standard of measures, where we understood what, what that movement meant from a modeling perspective. Um, all right, we'll have to go without slides. No worries. So what did I have at this moment? I have a set of equations that define the relationship between multiple positions, 17 positions on the body in time and space with associated physics, acceleration and rotation. That then describes mathematically sitting, standing, walking, and you can do enough of those replicates that then you build a twin of this or of sitting or of standing. So now I have this, this very good set of models for what is more or less nominal behavior. Now, if I twist my ankle or if, um, if my knee starts to hurt, what I can do is input the data from that motion either after the ankle problem, after the knee problem, uh, whatever that may be, input it into that digital twin and have the digital twin output for me essentially what the difference is and quantify it. So we were doing, I did studies where I measured somebody before knee surgery and after knee surgery, and I could give them a percentage of improvement over time based on using the twin as a means of what? First, understanding what the optimal behavior is, Second, what the behavior looks like when there's some damage. Third, when some therapy is applied. Um, when the models were worked out pretty well, I, I gave that to a colleague and I said, here are my girls. One is in a lot more pain than the other. Here, here's the twin that I built for human motion. Um, apply it to them, score them, and then tell me as a function of, 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 of a scale of, one, of point zero to point 0.1, sorry, zero to one, what each pain index is. They went, they did that absolutely spot on. One girl scored like a 0.28, the other one a 0.92. Completely blinded analysis. So what does that tell me? That tells me that the models I built on everything, thank you, everything from uh, sitting, standing, from putting your leg up and down on a chair, all this is, by the way, the motion in time and space. This is the physics. And this is a great conduit. Uh, for example, if your thighs hurt or if your knees uh, are sore and you sit down, I can measure the change in how hard your butt hits the chair, which is a function of how well your quads are controlling your body. And what that does, there, oh, I was right, 0 0.28, 0 0.92. So if you watch this movie, and I'm afraid to click the button, uh, you. <laughs> if you watch that movie, what would happen is you'd look at those two girls and you could not figure out which one is moving different from the other. Okay, I can't play the movie then. Now you tell me if you can tell which one is moving in pain and which one is not. I can't. And I've known them for a while. When you apply my set of models, which represent this digital twin of human motion, and you score them, and what does that mean? The twin is getting data from them, and then it's feeding data back out. It gives me, I've set it up to give me a score. And that's a dramatic difference, but it's visually impossible to notice. That's, that's what I'm talking about, this idea of bi-directional flow, streaming data, right? Those data are continuously being recorded. And each time we did the experiment, the models learned. And based on that score as a parameter, they became, quote unquote, smarter. Okay. I've got a couple minutes left. Then I went farther. I really thought, well, we can't just do observational studies. We need to do pharmacological studies. But of course, I, I wasn't going to do that on my kids. So I'm an arthritic as well. So what I did was, was I took that model but this time I tweaked it for a response to an analgesic, 400 mg of ibuprofen, uh, 
Nominal state is discomfort, joint pain, sit, stand for 30 seconds, which by the way is a standard uh, test that, the, um, uh, uh, that is used in medicine for stability and, and, and basic control. It's called the 30 second sit, stand test. Do that test, take the meds, do the test again, uh, continuously monitor, uh, work those models and look what happens. Here's how my shoulder changes in motion. By the way, this is a, a, a dimensional graph. So the, um, the motion is obvious. The color represents forces and the size represents rotation. So it's a lot to, to interpret here. But what's happening here is this is telling me, and I measure this, that as I sit and stand and I'm not in pain, my center of gravity doesn't change. When your knees are in pain, you're gonna lean forward to get up and sit down. You can see that. You can see with the knee and the hip. So imagine if you were thinking about a complex process and you thought, well, I could build a model of it. What's the value of that model? It told me what happened in the past. If you build it to tell you what is happening now, how it's changing, it learns from it, then you're in the world of a digital twin. And that, that was sort of the message I'm trying to get. So whether we, we start with what? We analyze motion in, and in discomfort and not in discomfort. Then we understand, well, how do we compare? Uh, use that digital twin to compare you to me. So we have a, a set of global standards that we use. How then do we use patterns from the digital twin that then it could detect that it's knee pain versus ankle pain? That's again, more models. And then finally, how can you automate the process that you don't have to go to the doctor, you just sit in front of a camera, you sit and stand, and you get diagnosed. That you have a knee problem, your meniscus is bad, whatever that may be. That's coming, that is absolutely coming. So, and, and if with two minutes to go, I'm right on time. This is, this is kind of an important statement. Uh, when you bring together connectivity, and, and from a plant sciences perspective, uh, there is value in doing experiments where, when you connect not only the, 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 the environmental factors, uh, the ecological factors, uh, the factors involved in agricultural practices, the genetics, uh, the genomics. Um, if, if you connect all that, because it's possible today, right? Whether it's sensing data from drones or satellites, whether it's sensors in the field, whether it's sensors on the machinery. When you bring that together and you have the computational means that are economic and effective, when you have the modeling capabilities that are uh, affordable and effective, can you imagine building for a farmer a digital twin of their crop, of their farm? soil, environment, and so on, and using that to drive decision-making in pest control, in, in, in um, uh, a fertilizer, uh, when to plant, what to plant, so on and so forth. This concept of digital farming, that's, we're even beyond that, I think, now. I really think that we're into this situation where the digital twin of that farm exists only because it's also connected to all the sensors on that farm and it's being continuously updated. It learns season after season and the decisions get better and better. So that, that is a reality. And what that, what that implies is a kind of nervous system. And I'll end with this, and this is scary, but I'm telling you, it's, 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 it's a pretty good analogy. So, most of us are really familiar with the nervous system. And it works really, really well. I'm a walking bag of sensors. I'm collecting those data. I'm processing those data. I'm using models that I've learned from the past to interpret the new data that's coming in. I sometimes adjust those models to make my decisions about what I sense. The amount of stuff I sense is incredible. I have to filter most of it. And I only collect some of it. There's the nervous system. Now, what happens if you put analogies of technology to that nervous system? You have concepts such as, as I mentioned, edge analytics, sensors thinking on their own and reflexive action. You have uh, this fog, this concept of decision-making, data collection, and model execution in between the storage and the sensor, right? Uh, the cloud itself, you can think of the, the brain. What is really frightening 
is that our technology right now, whether by design or by accident, is literally recapitulating the human nervous system. The architecture of our technological world is the human nervous system. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. And generative AI is just another example of how this is actually happening. Uh, Skynet is not here yet, but I'm telling you that, that digital twins are a component of eventually creating a technology that will mimic how humans interact with their environment, how they learn, and how they use that to make decisions. All right, two minutes extra, sorry for that. Uh, and, and with that, I'm gonna thank you for your attention. Uh, making a digital twin is not as hard as you think, but it, it does require access to high dimensionality data. You gotta collect a lot of dimensions, often high frequency data, you need to use good historical training data to build the base models. And then you need to figure out how to connect the two so that the execution occurs as streaming analytics and provides you some output uh, that, that is an answer for now, but it could change tomorrow, depending on what it's learned and what it's experienced, just like us. With that, thank you so much. So if you have any questions, hopefully you can hang around and talk to Mark after uh, our next speaker. So I'd like to introduce Haley Hauser, who's with the Data Sciences Academy at NC State. Very tough a person to follow up. Um, I am not as animated. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Haley Hauser. I'm with the Data Science Academy. I am our digital communications coordinator. I am standing in for Dr. Daniela Jones. Um, she is our faculty director um, of agricultural analytics with the Data Science Academy. And so I want to really open up with the data science is for everyone. And you kind of see, saw how Dr. Wolf was able to highlight all of the different ways that the SaaS software system can be used. And we really want to highlight the fact that data science can truly enter into every field. One story, um, I recently interviewed a student. He is a non-traditional student. He's here for his master's degree. He has been 11 years with the Coast Guard. He is currently taking our DSC 406 class, which is, are, hold on, I had to write it down, exploratory data analysis for big data. Currently, the project that he's working on is focused on sports analytics. He has a passion for D1 football. Um, Any D1 football fans here? A couple? Okay, <laughs> a couple? All right, so we understand that there is a lot of big D1 schools, like the University of Alabama. You have Alabama, you have Tennessee, you have the University of Florida, and they're bringing in these recruits that are also D1 recruits. Where are they getting these students from? And so he was able to take what he was learning in his class and apply it to the project. And he was able to find that there was a correlation between the money that universities were giving to high schools to help train those high school recruits and then bring them into in same in-state schools. That same exact data that he was, those data skills that he was using in that course he is now applying to his Coast Guard career where he actually helps plan out the emergency evacuation plans for cities. So to really kind of see that connection between the skill sets and being able to use very similar skills from our courses into completely different areas, we're really focused in on how can data science be for everyone. Now, am I gonna have issues? <laughs> okay, so I did leave in Daniela's um intro slide because i want you guys to know her face she is again our representative here with the plant science initiative um she handles a lot of the programs that are taking place with agricultural analytics um as well as puts on several programs with the data science academy to really kind of help amplify these skills opportunities and workshops for not only industry partners but academic partners as well so what is an in-state nc state academy so our academy is focused on bringing interdisciplinary studies to all 10 colleges at the university. And so we do that by reaching out through educational opportunities, research opportunities, um, 
an outreach into our community to really kind of be able to service all the different areas. A little bit about us, we are the first academy. We really like to shoot our horn on that. Um, so we were founded in July of 2021 and our mission and vision and goal, as you can see, we're looking to bring data science to everyone in all fields of study and making it accessible, ethical, and effectively used. So these are some of our core areas of where we offer a lot of opportunities. I'm gonna hit a little bit more on courses, internships, programs, and collaborative consulting in our future slides. But I really want to focus in here for some of our research enablement as well as some of our outreach. Part of our research enablement is seed grants. We offer seed grants to faculty and staff members who are doing interdisciplinary research focused in on data science and how data science is being used in their different fields. Um, currently, we have a project that we just released an article about today that is focused on revolutionizing farming. So I would definitely encourage everybody to go out and read that article. Um, we also have our K-12 outreach, and our K-12 outreach program is currently looking to bring data science to all K-12 curricula, not just in the science and math courses of those, but really bringing it into the English and social sciences as well. Again, trying to bring data science across all fields of study. So, more than 93% of agricultural and life science companies said they expect at least one or more future positions will either require or benefit from our data. And then 71% said that it will grow substantially in the next five to 10 years. So meaning if you're somebody who's in this room, you're definitely going to be using data science at some point, and we hope that you come and use it with us. I wanna go through our courses a little bit. So we have a unique course model that we teach through. It is project-based, so all of our courses are one credit hour courses, and you're not working toward a test. We're not standing in front of you lecturing the whole time. We are here to give you hands-on opportunity with these skills so that you can build them and take them on later on in life. With that, it is called the ADAPT course model, and it is our all-campus data science accessible project-based teaching and learning model. Very, very long. I love using the word ADAPT. <laughs> rather than saying it all out. We also have three different levels of courses. We have our courses who are for beginners. This is for anybody who has zero data science experience but really wants to get into that hands-on experience all the way up to our research ready levels, which is more of our graduate level courses. So you'll see that we have 200, 400, 500 level courses. In each of those levels, we have courses that we offer that are permanent. Um, and then we also have courses that change on a semester to semester basis. So if you have a particular subject that you're really interested in, or you think that is needed, we love to hear that feedback to see how we can service our community just a little bit better. Another thing with our courses, we have recently launched our minor and our certificate. We are also going to be launching additional minors and certificates in the upcoming semester. So we definitely encourage you to keep watching our website, um, keep watching our social media platforms because we'll be advertising um, the different opportunities that you have for those credit hours while they are listed as undergraduate. Um, we are working on several ways for um, non-credit, non-degree seeking students um, to be able to apply for those courses as well as graduate students. So the Agricultural Data Science Certificate at NC State um, serves both professionals and graduate students. You can see that you can earn this digital badge um, where the fundamental courses are in stats, methods, and, commute, and computing, um, in addition to having advanced analytics and ag data. And so uh, to contribute to our education of the community that is well first in ag analytics, Daniela was able to successfully develop and implement and process this um, graduate agricultural data science certificate. And so it's designed for students with a background in aquaculture who also want to learn data science through agricultural data science sets. And the QR code will take you to the website. Everybody got it? Okay. Um, which will then kind of go into some of the details of the courses. And as you can see here, our partners at SAS. We like to teach the software systems that you guys are going to be able to use. And so with our agricultural and analytics the ag data, you'll see that we really go into depth with the SAS visual analytics, um, as well as using that software in various ways. This program currently has 19 students enrolled and seven have since graduated. 
um, and we're only looking to grow it even more. With that, we also have custom courses for our industry partners. Um, so with our industry partners, we collaborate with them to create um, training to upskill your company or your organization. And so if you have a particular program that you really want to come in and work on, we can definitely develop a course for um, your staff where they can bring in their current projects, learn the hands-on, and then come out with results of those projects as well. These are just a couple of examples. The one on the left is an example of data at work with extension and PSI. Um, and this is focused on the use of public data sets and how local growers in the region can benefit from this information. Um, we also have a testimonial on the right hand side from our DHHS Division of Children and Development Children of Child Development and Early Education. Um, they came in for a particular um, course that really kind of focuses on Excel and giving their um, staff the ability to dive a little bit deeper into that. And so this program is also kicking off for us. And so if you're interested, if you reach out as an industry partner, we can always help develop and train your staff in these areas. We have internships where we like to bring students into rural NC as well as into some social impact programming where they're using data science on a regular basis. Our ag teams are also out in the field using what they use on a day-to-day -day basis um, to really kind of focus in not only having the hands-on experience in the classroom, but also having the hands-on experience outside of the classroom um, to be able to carry that into their potential careers. And lastly, we have our collaborative consulting. So our collaborative consultants are in um, alignment with our university libraries. We pair up with our data visualization team um, and our collaborative consultants are graduate research assistants who are able to help not only students and faculty um, and staff at NC State really kind of assess a particular complex data set. Um, but we also work with industry partners there as well, where if you need a little bit more intensive help or if you're working on a project and you're looking to give um, a student kind of that experience for a cheaper price, <laughs> um, companies can come in and we can sponsor a consultant um, and have them work specifically with your company on that. And then we have our programs. So I mentioned earlier that we don't only offer courses, we offer programs for an opportunity to upskill as well. Some of our main programs that the DSA offers yearly and monthly, that's, Data Fest is coming up for us. We have a couple of um, industry partners coming in to help train our students on this, but the American Statistical Association has been hosting Data Fest for years, and so it is a national um, competition for undergraduate students to solve a complex data set over the course of a weekend. We really focus in on the collaboration of those teams. Graduate students, if you are interested, you're more than welcome to come and be a mentor for us. The signups for that are online. We also have our Data Science Career Expo, which we offer every fall. We are also looking to start collaborating with other colleges, again, to bring that interdisciplinary into the schools. And we just recently collaborated with the College of Sciences, Math, and hosted the Science, Math, and Data Science Career Expo as well. We do have monthly talks. So if you live in the area, once a month, we have an AI Hot Topic, where we bring in, or we bring in, um, Woo, experts there, industry experts, um, to kind of talk about different AI topics that we want to highlight. And it gives an opportunity for people to network, talk a little bit about those hot topics, and then be able to discuss it a little bit further as well. And so we've had several industry partners come to those um, and have highlighted the ethics, diversity, AI bias, uh, we even had one in February that was about matchmaking um, and how those applications work. Here, Daniela has done a phenomenal job of integrating a lot of ag data science programs. Our ag data science jam was offered in um, the fall of 2022, and it was a hands-on discovery workshop. She also brought in the ag data optimization and introductory hands-on 
workshop. Um, again, bring together that ag science, data science, and giving people an opportunity to go in um, and really work with the skill sets through learning. In collaboration with the Plant Science Initiative, um, the DSA is also working with them on the hackathon. Our first one was this past semester. And we have three tracks. Again, really kind of focusing in on we want people who have zero experience to also be welcome to come to tracks like track one at our beginner levels, but also giving the challenges to our very experienced data scientists um, and bringing them in on those track threes. And it's not just upskilling workshops that we offer, it's also professional development <laughs> workshops that we offer, giving students an opportunity to come in and learn about where career paths are heading, how to interview well for those agricultural career paths, and how to really negotiate those salaries. So really coming together to complement the whole rather than just the skill sets that we can teach. And that is my last one. <laughs> this slide, um, is has our newsletter. Our newsletter will actually go out on March 4th. We have a quarterly newsletter where we are highlighting several different um, feature stories about what we're doing, several different opportunities that are happening out in um, at NC State. You can follow us on all the social media platforms. And then again, if you want to connect with Daniela Jones, uh, her information is up there as well. I want to, I don't know if you guys have any questions or if we're saving that for the networking. Uh, we have time, so yeah, if anyone wants to ask questions. Cool. Questions for Andy? Or any questions for Dr. Wolf? Oh, we got some questions. Hmm. So, I love you, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> but, I'm getting into the world of data science recently, but what I've noticed so far, at least my, my perception, is that there are a lot of resources uh, available for to work with machine learning and AI. So in my perception, there are a lot of resources to work with machine learning and data science and AI for other a softwares like Python and um, mostly Python. So where can we find those resources for SAS and why is it like, it seems like it's it's not out there as evident as you can see for other kind of softwares? Sure, so I think all of us are aware um, of the sort of the two worlds of uh, open source and commercial software. Um, both have their place. Both are very important. Uh, there's um, a certain need on the part of institutions, companies, to, to have commercial software to do their business. Um, those, those needs arise from a level of quality, consistency, uh, and so on and so forth. So the place for commercial software it, it is absolutely critical and important. Uh, you know, Linux is not free if you're an industry. You, you have to pay Red Hat <laughs> to have an open source open system. So there's also that kind of intermediate area. Uh, open source, I use, I'm not a coder for full disclosure, but I've become an amazing coder since chat. I pay my $20 a month now for chat. <laughs> and I spend a lot of time on open source software. And so I think the key will be in the future and it's, it's happening now, is that uh, commercial software entities uh, are working very hard to create um, uh, ways to their software and from their software to open source APIs, right? So I know that, that uh, there are some things I will do. Uh, I've, I've done a project in generating synthetic data. I didn't spend too much time on it because I really didn't have the time, but synthetic data can improve model. So you can take a sample, create synthetic data and improve the models for that sample. Often that will require for me working between Python, Jupyter Notebook, SAS. Um, SAS provides me certain capabilities with a high degree of automation and more point and click because I'm not a coder. We can pay for that. <laughs> if you wanna do it yourself and figure everything out and do everything with lines of code, 
that's for free. And there's a balance in between. Um, I know that in certain government uh, uh, grants that you may want to apply for, they stipulate open source. The government says you can't use commercial software because frankly, the government doesn't want to pay overhead for you to buy commercial software on your grant. It's a complicated world, but I think this, the answer to your question is that commercial, commercial software companies provide uh, a means by which you can work with open source when, when you need to or want to. And if you don't need to use or can't afford them, uh, there are open source alternatives for you to work in. So uh, like I said, on my SAS laptop, I have a full Python environment and I use it a lot. This might be a question for Danny, but <laughs> um, I was just curious when you uh, talked about the Ag Data uh, Analytics Certificate that she's put in place, um, and you mentioned it's not just for students at NC State, but also for professional development. Um, I was curious, do you have an idea of the profile of the types of students um, who are looking for professional development that uh, the course really suits? I mean, is it for folks coming from industry that may be working in ag research that would like to develop their data science skills or is it for maybe for growers who would like to apply those tools on the farm or is it a little bit of both? I was just curious if you had any information on that. I'm not gonna lie, I don't have much information about the ag specifically, um, the ag side specifically. Um, I do believe that it was developed especially for professionals, non-degree seeking students able to come in and get the tracks that they want, um, as well as graduate students to be able to come in. I know a lot of our certificates and majors were coming in, um, our certificates and minors that we're offering are coming in um, from non-degree seeking spaces um, to be able to develop that skill, have it later. Um, so I know that that's the goal for the DSA is to always be able to offer it to non-degree seeking students and make it applicable to their jobs later. Ray, I don't know if that's, sorry, my executive director, Ray Levy um, of the Data Science Academy definitely has some more insight if um, I did not hit. I thought you did okay. great. You did great. I think, I think, I'm just trying to think of the, the individuals that Danny has talked to me about. Sorry, that they're in the program. Um, Haley was spot on. Um, I think there has been a grower, but a grower who had a more technical background. I don't think it's going to be an easy ramp up for a grower who has not been using computing but I think that's what our what our ag agent um, series is for is to get ag agents to start engaging growers and then bring those growers in to that same series eventually with the open source data. I think the certificate is really a, a much more you know preparing you to do pretty serious data science using SAS products, even getting SAS certification along the way. So I think that is less. I think it, it may be more um, uh, from industry but in that technical space, probably more for the certificate. And, and just so people know, all of our certificates at NC State are open to non-degree seeking students. That's a characteristic of our certificates. It's really cool. But if you want to get a minor, you have to have a major. If you want to have a major, you got to be in a degree program. So that's an interesting thing I learned when I came. Any more questions? Oh, question for Mark. Uh, great presentation too. I loved your presentation, by the way. Um, and I empathize with you because that's also my style of presentation as well. I like presenting that way. Anyways, I was thinking of your digital twins and uh, I'm wondering uh, where are we right now in terms of digital twins creating their own digital twins and then creating their own digital twins, you know, and, and so on and so on, right? Like, uh, do are we, are we there yet? Or is that something that we have not, we're not there yet? Fascinating question. Um, so the concept of a digital twin really is first and foremost an industrial concept. That's where it came from. Uh, I mentioned the Apollo 13. Uh, everybody who ever talks about digital twins always references that as sort of an analog version of here's a problem, let's recreate the problem. Here's what happens, well, let's make it happen here. So you can see that bi-directional flow of data, right? Um, I'm actually working on a pro so so I've spent some time. I was really fascinated by this question of synthetic data, and and at first, as as really a biologist, I said, it's insane. 
making up data to improve analysis? That makes no sense what's at all. Turns out it makes a lot of sense. And I started really focusing on how to generate really good synthetic data to augment existing data. And in doing so, improve the value of the models you have. They score better. Um, and the project I was asked to support is uh, in a big industrial warehouse, you have um, a 20, 30, 40 big uh, fans uh, cooling whatever the, the assembly line or whatever that is. And a huge, huge application of digital twins in the industrial world is something called predictive asset maintenance. So you're monitoring an asset, locomotive, uh, a ship, a fan, I'm working now on a bioreactor, fermenters, very complex processes. How do you monitor them, predict when they are going off ideal uh, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, parameters and when a component might fail? So you, you stop that device, replace that component, and you don't, you don't lose downtime. And so we have one example of a fan. We've been building a digital twin of it across many, many different sensing parameters, every kind of voltage, rotation, torque, you name it, we're measuring it. We're modeling nominal in different environments, heat, humidity, on and on and on. And when we got to the point where we could anticipate and predict a bearing failure in the fan, where we could anticipate an, a, a voltage inverter going bad and replacing it before it goes bad, then we got the idea, well, that's just one, how would we do it if a place had 50? So instead of getting 50 fans and doing that, we just cloned the twin and slightly manipulated it based on different parameters, different location, uh, maybe different rotational speeds or whatnot. So in a sense, the answer is yes, we took one and we cloned it and, and still made it a robust sort of twin that, that supports the objectives of maintaining the highest level performance for that equipment. Um, would they do it themselves? I don't actually know how to answer that because I, I suspect you could program it to create a clone of itself if you gave it enough information, right? It's uh, when you make a baby, you have a set of genes, but you need another set <laughs> to finish the, the process. So. More of a philosophical question. I no, guess, well, right? I, I, I'm taking it quite practically because in a sense, I'm cloning a bunch of digital twins. Why couldn't they do it themselves in response to some stress? Awesome. Oh, well, one, one more quick question. One more I can just ask later. How's your time? One more? Okay, Adrian says one more. Uh, thank you. So I was, I was, my mind went wandering about your um, comment about throwing away data, you know, and, and sort of locally making those decisions right. so that later you can't reconstruct it because it really got, it really got thrown away. Um, and I was thinking a lot about um, different sources of bias in data. So you bias the data in the first place by where you send the sensor. You missed some things, right? You made some choices. And so we're never pretending that we got everything from the first place. So let's assume it already was biased by where the sensor was, but now you're gonna throw some things away, you know, and, and we already sample. So we already threw some things away, right? Because we don't, we can't collect everything. And so I think it's interesting to think about how much bias you might introduce by your choices about throwing away compared to the biases you introduce other ways, like, not even sampling in the first place, or because you know, because you can only sam sample so often, but you usually sample regularly, those kinds of things. So, how how do you think about those sources of bias, and in when you when you think about the advantages of throwing away data in order to have a reasonable amount of data? I once remember giving a talk and being very adamant. And this was some time ago um, that I thought the notion of sampling is ridiculous. We can collect all the data. Why sample? Honestly, remember the term big data? Or, and then there are other terms. And there was a point in history where there's no point to sampling. You could literally collect as much data as humanly possible and just look at the population. 
And then we get to the internet of things and connectivity and sensors and streaming data. And we're back to it's impossible to collect all the data. Um, and I don't know when the last time you checked how much it costs to store data in the cloud. It's expensive. <laughs> And the volatility of data over time as different means of storing data change. I, I actually go back to the, to the, to the, the human metaphor. Um, we don't remember everything we experience, but we somehow still function. Uh, we all exist with tremendous biases. If, if you ask, uh, do you think this room is comfortable? And my, I'm sensing temperature, I'm sensing humidity. I'm, I'm doing a lot of sensing right now, the light. And I might say, this room is perfect. You might say, no, I'm very uncomfortable here. That's bias. But what is that bias based on? It's previous experience. You found you, you're more comfortable. You grew up in a cold climate or you grew up in a hot climate. You've adapted. We'll never get rid of bias. And to think we could in data is ridiculous. The question will be, which is now we're moving from these large language models to now this concept of RAG, which is where you're introducing very deep domain as context to the large language model. So the large language model hallucinates, why? Well, it's read everything. It's responding to a query based on a probabilistic distribution of your prompt, which it's parsing as, as syntax and then saying, well, this word next to this word occurs most often in everything I've ever read. So probably the answer to your query will be these words together. That's not necessarily in context. So what we're doing now to address this issue is the answer comes back with some very deep set of learnings from your domain, medicine, engineering, cooking, whatever that may be. That's an attempt to address bias by introducing an expert system, not a generalized system. So I think the answer to your question will be, we'll have to throw away data. We'll only end up keeping the results, but we'll have to apply an expert system to put the results into context to see if they make sense. We won't have to rebuild the results from the data because we won't have the data, but we'll have to rely on the result and put the result into context. And if you think about how humans work, you think it's context. We don't make a decision without thinking where we are, what are the consequences, that's context zone and so forth. So the answer is we'll never get away from bias, no matter how hard we try. We'll develop techniques to address it. We're already moving past large language models and moving into uh, um, expert-based systems as adjudicators of large language models. And we'll move on to the next and the next. Strangely enough, I have an incredibly deep faith in technology. So, uh, but will we make machines in our image with the good and the bad? You know, that I don't, that I can't answer. Wow, talk about philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> that was deep. Yeah. Was thank you. Let's thank our speakers again. If you'd like to come on up to the Innovation Hub, go up. You can take the elevator or the stairs, go to the third floor. You'll be able to find the room. It has um, the signs outside of the companies that are industry partners. I also forgot to say what my name is. I'm Kathleen uh, Kathleen Denia, by the way. I'm the Director of Innovation Partnerships for the Plant Sciences Initiative. So um, I'm happy to connect with, uh, with new people and love to talk to you. So let's go have a drink. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.